Aloha. Uh, my name is Scott. I'm the lead pastor at International. Really glad that you are with us today. Man, kids these days. All right, millennials, Gen Z. Am I right? It's odd. It really is odd because they can't even. I, ha I have pause for laughter. Nobody? All right, if you can get that, you got to ask somebody next to you. Uh, I recently read a quote uh, that I think just captures the problem pretty well. This person wrote that the children today now live and love luxury. They have bad manners, contempt for authority. They show disrespect for their elders. Children now are tyrants, right? You know who said this? Socrates, 5th century B.C., <laughs> He also went on to complain about young people back then, uh, saying that he was frustrated they no longer stood up when uh, older people entered into the room. They ate too many sweets, they tyrannized their parents and teachers, and worst of all, they sat cross-legged. The nerve. Obviously, we don't have that problem today. Uh, at least when I, this quote was often attributed to Socrates, when I went to try and find like a primary source, I couldn't find one. So. Just FYI, he probably didn't say it. Somebody thinks he did. But nonetheless, it, it captures, I think, the essence of this idea that uh, throughout time, every generation has had trouble getting along with the next one and the one before it. That's just always been the case. Every generation has felt slighted and, and ignored and put down by the generation above them, and then they have felt that the generation after them was entitled. It's a pattern, cyclical, throughout time. Every generation thinks they're the ones who have figured it out, and everybody just needs to stop changing things. And, and while strife between generations and people groups is nothing new in the world, however, such friction between people of di different generations should not be mirrored in the church. The church understands, above all, that God cares about every single person and cares about every generation, and He has sovereignly and carefully crafted every single one of us to make a meaningful and valued contribution to God's mission for the redemption of the world. We need the experience and the wisdom of the older generations, and we need the fresh insights and boundless energy of the younger generations. We ought not be dismissive of one another. We ought not assume the worst about one another. The church should be the last place where such attitudes are found. Because the Bible really does care about how we relate to one another. At International, I really am so thankful. When you look around this room, there is a generational spectrum that we get to enjoy in this church family. And this is seriously a gift of grace from God. At International, we want to honor and celebrate the presence of Kapuna and Keiki. They're both beautiful and valuable. I am thankful to be at a church with Grandma Mac and Grace Kowatch. Tiny little Grace. And, of course, all of you, too. Now, this fall, we've been studying through the letter of 1 Timothy. It's a series we've called Guardians, based on 1 Timothy 6.20, where the Apostle Paul tells his young colleague, Timothy, to guard what has been entrusted to your care. See, Timothy was tasked with setting up the church in Ephesus while Paul continued to travel throughout the Mediterranean. Now, Ephesus was the second largest city in the Roman Empire at the time. Now, today we're going to start getting into chapter 5. If you have a Bible or a Bible app, or uh, there are some under the chairs as well, if you'd like to use those, I'd encourage you to open it up. Um, we'll have it on the screens as well, but I still encourage you to open it up. Follow along with me. It is always good to, to open the Word of God, to know where things are, to read things in context as well. And then if I say something crazy, you can check me on it. So today we're going to get in chapter 5. Last week we worked through chapter 4, and we saw that all believers are really called to guard and obey God's Word together. We should be trained in godliness. We must allow the Holy Spirit to work out what Christ has put in, the salvation we have by faith in Him. And now Paul's going to turn the topic toward interrelationships within the church. How should Christians 
relate to each other. And Paul gives a pretty clear and concise thesis statement at the beginning of chapter 5 in verses 1 and 2 about how that should look. 1 Timothy 5, 1 and 2, Do not rebuke an older man harshly, but exhort him. Or the word also say, encourage him as if he were your father. Treat younger men as brothers, older women as mothers, and younger women as sisters with absolute purity. How you see people informs how you treat them. Now, for most of us, when we encounter people in the world, we tend to divide them up into two camps. There's our opponents, there's our rivals, they're the people who uh, we're trying to somehow defeat, outperform, be better than. They're the, the competition. There's either a competition or, or there's allies, and there's friends. There's people who we feel like who are on our side, people whom we can maybe use to propel ourselves forward in life somehow. Right? We divide people up into they're either for us or they're against us. They're either a, a friend or a foe. As humans, we seem to have this natural inclination to quickly assess people and put them into one category or the other. Are you going to help me or are you going to hurt me? Are you a threat or are you an opportunity? Are you a friend or are you a foe? Of course, we're always hoping to collect more friends and uh, trying to crush the foes. But as Christians, I think we need to fight that natural urge we have to classify people based on their usefulness to us. We tend to classify people on how they benefit us. They do or they don't. We need to fight that urge because how you see people informs how you treat them. Now, we might think that God would tell us, okay, you should see everybody as a friend, all right? You should all be friends. You should all get along, see one another as allies, as people who are going the same place, same values, same love for Jesus. Be friends. You're all on the same team. But God doesn't say that. God does not call us to friendship. He actually calls us to something much deeper than friendship, something much more permanent, something much more glorious, something much more messy, but also something much more unconditional. God calls us to see one another as family. Why? Because that's actually what He has made us. Everybody who puts their faith in Christ is placed into the family of God. Therefore, we should treat believers like family because they are family. We should treat older men like fathers, it says. Honor them. Show them dignity and respect that you would publicly give to your own dad. See older men as valuable sources of guidance and wisdom because they really have lived a long time. They do know a lot of of lessons, a lot of things they know, they've gleaned through experience. And almost all the older men I know are more than willing to share those lessons with you. We should treat younger men as brothers. All right, for Timothy, that means if, if you're a dude that other guys, or like Timothy was, hey, don't see other men as rivals or opponents. They're like you. You have the same father in God. And this brotherhood word, Con, uh, it kind of has some connotations of, of openness, of fellowship, of honesty, of, of care, respect, concern, right? It means we have our brothers back and we have concern for them. We should treat older women as mothers. I am so thankful, not just for my own biological mother, but for the many mothers in my life and that have been in my life. The handful of women who have been mothers to me uh, as a young man, they continue, some of them, to be nurturing, encouraging, prayerful, guiding, helpful to me on the path of life. And then Paul tells Timothy to treat younger women as sisters with absolute purity. Not just a little bit of purity, not just a decent amount of purity, 
absolute purity. Now, for those of us guys who are lucky enough to have a biological sister, there's a very natural revulsion in us to, at the thought of lusting after our biological sister. That just feels, sounds, is all kinds of, ugh. Yeah, it should be. It is wrong. It is gross. It, it's unthinkable. I'm not even going to think about it. I'm thinking about other things right now. But I think there's an analogy there that Paul is very, very intentionally making. Just as unthinkable as it might be for you to lust after your biological sister, it should be that unthinkable for you to lust after your spiritual sister, reducing her to an object, a nice collection of body parts for you to enjoy. That should be unthinkable as well. The church should be the safest place in the world for everyone to be, especially young women. They should not have to worry about lingering looks, about lewd comments, or about inappropriate behavior here. That is unacceptable in God's family. At least it should be. See, if you wouldn't think that thought, guys, if you wouldn't make that comment, if you wouldn't do that thing with your biological sister, then why on earth do you think it's okay to do that with your spiritual sister? It's not. You shouldn't think of your spiritual sister in any different way. Now, for young ladies, the opposite is true of you. If you would not fantasize about your biological brother in this way, then don't treat your spiritual brother that way either. We, too, are not just a collection of nice body parts. You like how I called myself young there? It's very subtle, very subtle. You might not have caught it. Now, obviously, this text is not forbidding the involvement of romantic relationships between men and women. Obviously, there's room for that in the Scripture and in the family of God. It's simply giving a blueprint outside of a romantic relationship with one person of the opposite gender. Outside of that, we should treat one another as brothers and sisters. Treat believers like family because they are family. God says we are his family, so we need to see each other that way, and then we need to act that way. Now, now I do understand for some of you, the notion of family might not be a good one. Perhaps your family hurt you very, very deeply. Perhaps your experience of someone treating you like family means there was yelling, there was shaming, there was cursing, there was fighting, there was belittling, maybe abusing, maybe even worse. Family may not have positive connotations for you. I want you to know that I understand that. And even more important, God understands that. God gets that. God saw it all. God is very aware of what has happened to you, and it was wrong. That's not what God wants for you or for anyone else to experience. He is saddened by the rough family experience you may have had. However, if that is you, I want you to consider, just consider maybe... One of the ways that God, your heavenly Father, might want to redeem your awful family experiences is by recording over those tapes with positive family experiences in his family, in this one, with fellow brothers and sisters in Christ. He's brought you to a place where you can be loved and accepted without conditions. Because that's how Jesus treats us. He loves and accepts us unconditionally. He loves us just the way we are. Now, he loves us so much that he's not going to leave us the way we are, thank goodness. But he accepts us the way that we are. We're accepted into his family. And it's often that in the family, through the relationships of, of doing life with one another and with Christ, that that transformation comes in us. 
God wants to transform us through interactions, not just with him, but also with his family, with one another. In Acts, about 75% of the time when the Holy Spirit speaks and acts and moves, it's actually through his people to his people. It's among his family. And we look to Jesus, and we see Jesus is just the ultimate family member. Jesus will always treat you appropriately, like a brother, a sister, a father, or a mother, because Jesus values family. Just think back to that moment. Some of you may be familiar when Jesus is hanging on the cross. I mean, he is about to die moments away from breathing his last. He is hanging on the cross for the sins of the world, taking the punishment that was ours, not his. He, the innocent man, is dying in the place of us, the guilty. He's up there on the brink of death, and he looks down and he sees his mama and his buddy John. And he says, John, take care of mom. Take care of Mary for me. See, Jesus ensures that Mary is taken care of because she is about to be a widow who is also about to lose, or she's already a widow, but she's also about to lose her oldest son who was meant to be the caretaker of the family in the, in the first century ancient Near East. See, widows were incredibly vulnerable in the first century really throughout most of time. It was a very patriarchal society, and it was a very agrarian society, which means it was a society that valued men and property. And a widow usually had neither of those. And the Apostle Paul seems to share Christ's concern for widows in his day because he's actually going to dedicate the next 14 verses to talking about how the church in Ephesus should care well for the widows in their midst. Because the church is family, we should treat one another like family, especially those who have no family. So read with me. Again, 1 Timothy chapter 5, verses 3 through 10. Give proper recognition to those widows who are really in need. But if a widow has children or grandchildren, these should learn, first of all, to put their religion into practice by caring for their own family, and so repaying their parents and grandparents, for this is pleasing to God. The widow, who is really in need and left all alone, she puts her hope in God. She continues night and day to pray and to ask God for help. But the widow, who lives for pleasure, is dead even while she lives. Verse 7, give the people these instructions so that no one may be open to blame. Anyone who does not provide for their relatives, especially for their own household, has denied the faith and is worse than an unbeliever. Verse 9, no widow may be put on the list of widows unless she is over 60, has been faithful to her husband, and is well known for her good deeds, such as bringing up children, showing hospitality, washing the feet of the Lord's people helping those in trouble, and devoting herself to all kinds of good deeds. As the verses that Don read earlier, Psalm 68, verse 5, says that God is a father to the fatherless. He is a defender of widows. He is a judge of widows. Throughout the Old Testament and the New Testament, God constantly establishes very clearly his concern for those who are vulnerable in society and tells his people they should share those concerns too and to do something about it. And the poor are pretty much classified back then consistently in this kind of three groups. So there's the, the poor who are defined as orphans, immigrants, and widows. Being a widow is tough. No matter what century that happens in. Losing a spouse, whether through death, whether through divorce, whether through abandonment, is so difficult. Not only are our widows and widowers, widowers plunged into grief, but they're often socially more vulnerable. Even today this is true, even in our church, but throughout churches in general, there are many who have experienced this loss. So 
Being a widow is always hard. But as we consider this text, we do have to understand that the first century was a different world, a different society from the one that we live in today. There are some differences between us and first century Ephesus. We are, by and large, a very affluent culture, one of the most affluent that has ever existed. And we have access, by God's grace, to things like disability insurance, life insurance, long-term care insurance. We have access to things like 401ks, healthcare, nursing homes, assisted living centers. And these help provide care for our elderly, for our kapuna, and especially for widows in society. Now, obviously, not everybody has equal access to all those things. I recognize that. But I think we also need to understand, as a society, there is some measure of economic supply and protection. That was not there in the first century. There was none of that. And so women back then didn't have access to hardly any such economic aids. And that's why Paul encourages the church, hey, there's a gap here. There is a serious social need here. Church, you need to step into that and fill that. You need to help take care of the widows. Now, Paul is not expecting the church in Ephesus to financially support all the widows in Ephesus or all the widows in the Roman Empire. Now, he says, focus your aid to the widows who are within your church. See, there, there are some qualifications that Paul puts on this. There are some qualifications for determining who really is in need. And the first qualification is a widow who really is all alone, who really has no other options, should help poor widows who have no family. A widow's children and her grandchildren the Bible says, are responsible for looking after her. It is her biological family's job to recognize the need, step up, step into that need, and fill it. This is a consistent message throughout the Bible. This isn't just here. Taking care of your family well is everywhere. One of the most obvious places is in God's top ten. All right, the Ten Commandments the first four of them are about the human's relationship, Israel's relationship with God. And the very first thing he gives them, the very first law about relating to one another is honor your father and mother. Now, we love to quote this one at my house to my children. And in churches, we love to teach this verse to kids, right? Hey, 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 honor your father and mother. This verse was not given to children. God did not write this on the tablet and send it down and go, this is for the cakey. Just pass this one on. Ten Commandments were written to the adults. This was written to the adults of Israel. Honor obviously includes respect, obedience. But as we're going to see in a coming couple weeks, honor is also a euphemism for money. To show someone honor means to pay, support financially give, that word can include that as well. It just depends on the context. In this context, when you have a poor widow, showing honor is going to include money. Adults, one of the primary ways you show honor to your parents is with money if they are in need. Verse 4 says, this pleases God when it means financially providing for our family. Now, I know many of you. I know many of you are already doing this. And you were doing this so well. I'm so proud of you. I want you to know that God sees that. God knows the sacrifices you are making socially, economically, personally, physically, emotionally, to care for your parents and grandparents. Awesome. You are absolutely doing the right thing. God really does care about this. Giving your time, your energy, your resources to supporting your aging parents is the right thing to do. Right? Family is our first ministry, period. I mean, ver verse 8 here is, is pretty serious, y'all. Verse 8, anyone who does not provide for their relatives, especially for those of their own household, 
has denied the faith and is worse than an unbeliever. How could he say that? Because natural law, reality, teaches us quite obviously that you take care of your parents. Even unbelievers know you take care of your ohana. You don't have to have the Word of God tell you that it is obvious and plain. So if you're not going to do it, well, not only have you denied the Christian faith, which tells you to do that, but you've just denied natural reality. You're worse than the unbelievers who actually do this. Saying you follow Jesus and not providing for your family is at best inconsistent and at worst just an outright lie. You can't be doing both, he says. Now, most of you know that my parents were missionaries in Europe. That's where I was born and raised. And my parents had been there 28 years, serving the Lord, still loving it. Uh, The ministry was going well. God was using my parents in big ways. But they decided to give that up because of one comment from a trusted source. A close friend of my parents, who also lived near my dad's mom, my grandmother, who is a widow, he uh, helps keep an eye on my grandmother while my parents are overseas. And he also, and he and his wife, financially supported my parents. They prayerfully supported my parents. So when this guy took my dad aside in 2008, he made one comment. He said, Doug, it's time to come home. Your mom needs you. That was it. That was all my parents needed to hear. That was all they needed to know. Because my parents knew that family is the first ministry. So they immediately made plans to start transitioning out of their role in Europe and to move back to Colorado, continuing to work with World Venture, the mission agency, but to be closer to Nana. I'm proud of them for doing that. Y'all, they didn't really want to do that. Europe's pretty fantastic, and they were doing great. God was blessing what was going on. Leaving the mission field was hard. Been home for three decades. But obeying God and caring for their family was more important than obeying God and going to do the mission field. No, you can't do both. So maybe for you, you need to understand there may come a time when you need to take care of your parents or your grandparents, and it might require some serious sacrifice on your part. It might require you to do things you don't want to do, to move where you don't want to move, to change things you don't want to change. It might require sacrifice. Maybe that time is in the future, but maybe, maybe that time is now. Maybe you know that, but you've been ignoring it. Maybe this is the Lord's wake-up call for you. Are you helping your parents and your grandparents as they need? And it doesn't have to be you, but are you making sure that they are being cared for? It's not like you have to dote on their every need, but they're your responsibility. Are you making sure that they're taken care of? Are you committed to helping care for them in their old age? Because family is your first priority. Don't make the church do what you should be doing. Even if it's another church somewhere else where she or he lives. Second point he makes is that the church should help poor widows who are old. If you're over 60... This is not your favorite verse. Just to be clear, I'm not calling you old. Paul is. I mean, it's interesting that he actually puts a number on it. Isn't it? He's like, all right, if you're 60, you're old. (laughs) You get to be on the list. If you're 59, no, you don't. It's interesting to me, 60, why? They didn't have retirement age in Roman times. They didn't have Social Security. Why 60? We don't know clearly, honestly. Uh, Scholars' best guess is that kind of the age of 60 is a time when widows were unlikely to continue to work. Uh, Beyond that age, they're unlikely to remarry, and they're not going to have children. And part of this is because the life expectancy in Rome was around 60. There was even less for men. 
So to even find marryable men above 60 is unlikely. So it's just that, hey, unlikely they're not going to be able to make an income. They don't are, number one, they already don't have any kids around. And they're likely not going to get remarried. So this makes them more economically vulnerable than some of the others. Now, I don't think the church today needs to literally adopt, or every church everywhere, 60 years old, we help you, 59 and a half, we don't. I don't think that's the principle here. I think it's about focusing, though, on the greatest need. There is a principle here of prioritizing. Those who can work should work. That's what 2 Thessalonians 3.10 also teaches us. Don't be a burden to the church if you don't have to be. If there are other means of being taken care of, whether it's through working, whether it's through remarriage, then Paul encourages women to pursue that option. The church's financial aid should be a last resort in Ephesus, not the first resort. Now, so he's given kind of two things here that a widow has no control over. <laughs> no control over whether you, so you have family around to help you or your age. So those are circumstantial qualifications. However, he does add character qualification as well. Should help poor widows who demonstrate Christ-likeness. See, a woman qualifies for aid from the church if she has demonstrated her genuine faith in Christ through good works in her home and in her church. This is a woman who's been faithful, who's been kind, who's been hospitable and willing to serve, especially among the Lord's people, it says. And this is someone who depends on God and is devoted to prayer. And when I read this, I kind of have a natural question. But like, well, shouldn't the church care about all widows, not just the really Christian-y ones? Shouldn't we care about those widows who are maybe not so far along on their path with God? Of course. Of course the church should care about all widows. But in a fallen world with limited resources... A church, like everybody else, has to make some prioritizing decisions on the budget. And what Paul is saying is they should prioritize God's family. Because family takes care of family, right? It ties into that principle. It also ties into elsewhere in Scripture when we read, hey, you should do good to all people in Galatians, especially to those in the household of God. So there is a priority that brothers and sisters in the church have when it comes to needs. And these people are going to show their character in their Christ-likeness. In some sense, Paul here is, is, is seeing what the, the church's finances as an investment that the church can make in these widows, making in them as well as into the kingdom, right? Like, church, you help support widows and focus on the widows who are actually helping support the church. Focus on the widows who are actually helping support the kingdom of God. Focus on the widows who are giving you a great return on the investment, that are helping people, that are helping take care of everyone. Those are the widows that should have first priority in your church. This is a widow who's Christ-centered. She's not self-focused. She's not self-indulgent, right, off living, pursuing pleasure. She's pursuing Christ. She loves God. She loves people well. She serves and she engages her world for Christ. Now, reading this description, especially the part about her praying day and night, brings to mind a, a widow that we can read about elsewhere in the New Testament. Uh, her name is Anna. You can read about her in the Gospel of Luke, chapter 2. And uh, we see that Anna is really a great example of this kind of a widow. When we first meet her, uh, Mary and Joseph are bringing baby Jesus to the temple to be dedicated to the Lord, and we read that Anna is there in the temple. She's serving and worshiping God night and day. Even though she is 84 years old, and she was widowed only seven years into her marriage. So Jewish marrying age, she was probably 20, maybe her early 20s. So for 60 years, she has remained unmarried and has sought the Lord and served him and his people day and night in the temple. Anna was a widowed prophetess, and God actually gave her special insight about what the true identity of baby Jesus is, that he is not just a human child. He is the Son of God. So the church should support and honor widows 
who make good use of their time and their energy, who are investing themselves for Christ and his kingdom. Now, obviously, that's a goal that all of us should pursue, too. But then in verse 11, Paul turns his attention to people who are not qualified, to what he calls these younger widows in the church. Verses 11 through 16 say this, As for younger widows, do not put them on such a list. For when their sensual desires overcome their dedication to Christ, they want to marry. Thus, they bring judgment on themselves because they've broken their first pledge. Besides, they get into the habit of being idle and going about from house to house. And not only do they become idlers, but also busybodies who talk nonsense, saying things they ought not to. So I counsel younger widows to marry, to have children, and to manage their homes, and to give the enemy no opportunity for slander. Some have, in fact, already turned away to follow Satan. Verse 16, if any, woman, if any woman who is a believer has widows in her care, she should continue to help them and not let the church be burdened with them, so that the church can help those widows who are really in need. So if you read what he says here, and you add it to what we can read about in 2 Timothy, another letter he wrote to Timothy, 2 Timothy chapter 3, we see that there were these young women in the church who were apparently captivated by false teachers, and they were helping spread false doctrines throughout the church. It really just seems when you read about these two letters that there was just this group of young wild women just like running amok in the church. There just seems to be a bit of an out-of-control behavior, especially out-of-control with their words. Paul says when that's the case, they're actually showing that they ultimately follow Satan when, we don't control, when they don't control their words. They're accepting and they're spreading certain anti-gospel, anti-Jesus messages throughout the church. So Paul warns them, hey, y'all, simmer down. Right? Like, learn the truth. Learn sound doctrine, and just, whoa, focus on you. Take care of your family. Put yourself to work. You don't need to be idle. You need to be doing nothing. What is it that grandmas like to say? I, idle hands at the devil's workshop. Comes from here. Do something. If you've got nothing to do, find something to do, because doing nothing is not a good option ever. Now, he kind of seems to suppose that these younger women are going to lack wisdom. They're going to lack discernment in a way that the older widows don't. That they have maybe learned through experience, maybe through pain, the older widows to guard their words more carefully, to watch what they say and do. They keep busy with good works instead of becoming busy bodies who have nothing to do but gossip. Basically, Paul's encouraging younger widows here Keep doing the work that Christian women should do. Keep at it. Right? Keep working hard. Earn money for yourself. Take care of yourself. If you have the opportunity to get remarried, you should do that. If you're able to look after yourself, look after yourself. Manage yourself. If you have a husband, manage the household well with him. Take care of your family. Don't be a drain on the Ephesian church's resources unless absolutely necessary. Because while the church should support those in need, while we should treat believers like family because they are family, only those in need who are really in need don't have family around and are a great example to the church. Those are the ones that they should focus on. Now, for us today, I think there is still some application to this. There are still people, widows, in financial need. <clears throat> so in case you were not aware... Let you know, our church does have resources set aside to occasionally help members who are in serious financial need. We call it the Benevolence Fund. We set some, some money aside every year in the budget to go into that. It's also something anybody at any time can give to, and we store that away to simply use on members who are in need. So if you are in need or you know somebody in this room who's, who's in dire financial circumstances that the pastors and deacons might not know about, let us know. We can step in at the very least with maybe some financial guidance, maybe even some financial aid, some coaching. We would be happy to step in and be a help wherever we can be. Because as a church, 
We need to care for widows. We need to care for the vulnerable, right? I mean, this, this text and this sermon has been about widows, but of course, the church, we know we should care about all the socially vulnerable, widows, orphans, immigrants, and the poor. We demonstrate the genuineness of our faith by how we treat these groups of people that can't pay us back because we know that God has treated us with generosity when we could never pay him back. Compassion International is an organization out of Colorado Springs that uh, focuses on lifting children out of poverty in the name of Jesus. They're a Christian organization, and they work through local churches all around the world. Through the churches, and in partnership with the churches, Compassion helps bring uh, spiritual, educational, physical, and health-focused resources to children in poverty. Now, last year, our church was one of the sponsors for the Compassion Experience, there's the exhibit that was down at uh, Ala Moana. It was in the parking lot setup. I know some of you went there. I know my family did and really enjoyed it. It was kind of a, a time to walk through the exhibit, get a, a feel and a taste for what it's like for these children to grow up in poverty and how Compassion International comes alongside to help lift them out of that with the love of Christ. Well, Compassion actually has a second traveling exhibit. It's called the Compassion Journey. And again... Our church will be partnering with Compassion in this, except this time we're actually going to be hosting it at our church. Uh, we're going to be setting it up in the fellowship hall on the weekend from November 8th to 10th. We will need some volunteer help to kind of manage that over the weekend. If you'll, you'll get more information on that in the coming days and weeks, there are going to be other churches that are also going to be sending over volunteers. We're going to be the host site for Friday, Saturday, Sunday. Uh, after church on November 10th as well, we'll have an exhibit set up here in the Fellowship Hall in the Compassion Journey. Um, we're really excited to partner with Compassion and to bring this experience to you, to our church, as well as to offer it to our community. It's an opportunity for you and for your family to get a glimpse into extreme poverty, something we might not be very familiar with, and it is to allow ourselves to be moved to bring hope, to bring life, and to bring love to children all around the world. That Sunday, we're actually going to have a special speaker here as well. We're going to hear from somebody who was a compassion child, who grew up through the program, and what that experience was like for her. So you definitely won't want to miss that on the November 10th. She experienced this in the Philippines. So again, you'll get more information about this soon, but I just want to put this on your radar. Weekend of November 8th through 10th. It's kind of one of those events I don't think you're going to want to miss. And as a church, we want to be a church that actually lives out our faith. We know that we are not saved by works. We are saved by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. We understand that. But we also understand when James says that our faith is going to be demonstrated by our works. You can't say, I have faith, like, I'm a follower of Christ, but I'm not going to take care of Tutu. That doesn't work. So for us to say we are going to follow Christ, but we're not going to care about the socially vulnerable, about widows, orphans, immigrants, and the poor, that doesn't work either. So I just want to close. I'll return to widows and just kind of give each of us a challenge this week. Again, kind of back to the text. Chapter 5 began with the command to treat believers like family because they are family. Maybe there's something broadly there that God is saying to you. Maybe there's somebody that you haven't been treating as family in this room. Is there something God is maybe talking to you about? Is there somebody you need to go apologize to, ask forgiveness from? Do you need to go mend fence with somebody here? Or maybe just make the decision to start treating people better, like family, assuming the best about them rather than the worst but I also think there might be something here for the specific application in this text about widows, for how we should treat believing widows. So I have a very broad question for you. How could you care for a widow this week? Do you know one? If you don't know one, step one, get to know one. We have widows in this church. There are widows in your community. What's one thing you could do this week to care for a widow. One thing that you could do. Maybe she's in your family. Maybe she's in your church family. Maybe she's not. Maybe this is a, a widow you know could use a financial gift. 
Maybe that'd be a generous sacrifice on your behalf to give that to her. But maybe she doesn't need money. Maybe she needs a phone call. Maybe she needs a visit. Maybe she needs a wall painted. Maybe she needs her yard cleaned. Maybe she needs her car looked at. Maybe she needs a kind note from you. Maybe she needs prayer. Maybe she needs to be invited to your next family outing. How could you practically show love and care for a widow in your life, just like you would want someone to show care and love for your mom? And if you want to, I would love to hear what you end up doing. All right, this isn't a showboaty thing, but you can send me an email, Scott at in church. I just want to hear how did this work for you? You engaging with this widow, you, you making this decision to do one thing to care for them this week, what did you do and how did it go? If it's a tiny, just a one sentence thing, fine. I would love to hear it. Or next week, if you want to come back, write it on the comment card. I'd love to hear how God maybe uses this one little step, this little experiment in your life. What do you learn about family and about the family of God through that this week? I mean, church, imagine what kind of witness we would have to our community, we would have to our island, an island that values family and ohana. If they saw a group of people treat one another the way Jesus treats us, with perfect love, purity, kindness, patience, if people saw that we treated each other like family because we actually believe that we really are family, what would that do? How would people see us? Is this something they'd want to come and be a part of? I think so. You know, one of the things that families do, it's maybe my favorite thing that families do, is we eat together. One way we do this at International, I mean, if you haven't caught on to this by now, like, we have, like, a meal every month. But we actually have two meals every month. We always have a, a potluck or a picnic or some kind of thing, but we also celebrate communion together every month. When we eat together at the Lord's table, when we feast on His grace and His mercy a chance to remember for us what Jesus did for us when he gave his body and his blood for us on the cross, when he died to bring us into his family so that we could enjoy fellowship with him and with one another forever. Now, the way we celebrate the Lord's Supper here at International is we actually pass the element through the row. So you just take one, hold on to it, and then we'll all take it together as a family. And we practice an open table here, meaning that all believers are welcome to participate. Would you pray with me? Father in heaven, what a privilege to call you, Father. An undeserved privilege that you will say, come to me. Call me, Father. I will be your dad. And Lord, I thank you that you are not just my father, but you are father of all in here who are trusting in Christ. We are brothers and sisters. We relate to each other as such and as fathers and mothers. And God, we confess that we don't always do this well. We don't always do this perfectly. So Holy Spirit, help us to do this better. We cannot do this in our own strength. But we love being part of your family. We love having you as our dad. And we know that you love everybody in here. You gave yourself, Jesus, for us. And as we think on that, Lord, may this be a time maybe of, of confessing where we have fallen short. We thank you already for the forgiveness and grace you never fail to pour out on us. And Lord, we ask for your strength to help us treat one another like family because that's what we are, because you have brought us into your eternal family. Thank you for this time, Jesus. Thank you for this, this way to remember what you've done for us. Be with us in this time, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen.